God bless everyone out there. This is Sister Liberty and I'm back with another teaching for you. So I encourage you to examine yourself and to prove yourself because it is vital and important that you make your calling in election. Sure, you need to consider as a believer, as a Christian, what is it all for? Why? Do you do the things that you do as a Christian? Why do you go to church? Why do you pray? Why do you worship? Why do you read your Bible? And if you aren't doing these things, you should be doing these things. You are commanded to bless the Lord. You are commanded to gather with other believers. You are not to forsake the assembly of the brethren. You should read your word. I believe it's Paul who says to, and I forget how he words it, so I may rephrase it my way, but he says to study to show yourself. I think that is how he says it. Study to show yourself approved. Study. Study the word of God. And I believe it's, was it David who says to meditate on the word of God day and night? So as a Christian, there are things that you are supposed to be doing because you have to solidify your calling. So each and every one of us has a calling on our lives that we are obligating. We are obligated for fulfilling. You are responsible for fulfilling the responsibilities the purposes of God on your life. You are. And so that starts with having, number one, a firm foundation. If your foundation is not solidified, if your foundation is not sure, then how can you guarantee that you're going to make it in? Because Peter tells us that if we don't do these things, if so, we're going to read second Peter, we're going to read that. But There are characteristics that he makes mention in this passage that you and I are to display. You and I are to walk in. And if we don't walk in these things, he says that we are blind and we forget that we've been purged of sin. We forget the bondage that we were in. We forget the strongholds that kept us down, that kept us bound. We forget those things. And so it's almost as if we have scales over our eyes. And if we are blind, then we cannot see where we are going. If we are blind, then there's going to be lack. There's going to be a lack to what we don't have. We're going to think that we have things. And he says to examine yourself and prove yourself so that you don't be reprobate, so that you don't think within yourselves that you are okay the way that you are. You need to be mindful of where you are in the faith. Do you have areas of weaknesses? You know, are you lacking more love? Are you lacking charity? Are you lacking patience? You need to know because If there are areas of lack, then that means we need God to fill those areas. And we should be going to God to fill those areas. We don't want to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. Because I believe it's Paul or maybe John. Maybe it's John. We don't want to feel as though we've arrived. We don't want to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. Because if we think that we are something when we are nothing, then... God will have to humble us. God will have to humble us. God will have to bring us to a place where he strips us from the pride. Because he has to humble you. He has to bring you down low. And so we don't want to think that we are something when we are nothing. We have to humble ourselves and we must remain humble. But at the end of your life, You want to make sure that everything that you are doing as a Christian is not in vain. But you also have to consider what are you doing as a Christian? How are you living your life? Are you just someone who you are just completely okay with just being normal? A normal Christian, one 
who you only go to church on Sunday. You only go to church on Sunday. Every now and then, you know, you may touch your Bible. You may feel your Bible. You may open to a Psalms. You may open to John three sixteen every now and then. And, you know, when things get hard every now and then, you may say a little prayer. But is your foundation solidified? Because if it's not, when the rains come, when the winds come, When the floods come, then you are going to be easily uprooted. You're going to be a castaway. You're going to be one of those. You're going to be like the individuals or the the peoples that are like the troubled sea. You're going to be someone who is easily shaken and easily moved. Why? Because your foundation is not solidified. It's not set. It's not firm. It's not hard. It's not sure. You are someone that when adversity arises when opposition arises when life circumstances present themselves because you don't take your walk seriously then it's nothing for you to be moved in your emotions from the things of this life it's nothing for you to be tossed to and fro because of the winds or because of the rain or because of the flood or because of the storm it's nothing for you to be moved if your foundation is not solidified then what is it all for why are you doing it why do you take on the title of being a christian why do you go to church who is it for what is it for are you someone you like to be an entertained or our entertainer because we we've been discussing this as many of us here in America we have been controlled and governed by the spirit of entertainment and we've brought that into the house of God we've brought the spirit of entertainment into the house of God and we feel as though well if this church doesn't have anything to offer if they can't stimulate my senses or my emotions if they can't excite me if the pastor is boring if the worship is boring if they don't have nothing for their kids then you know I don't I don't want to serve God I don't want to come to church and so I think that's a key component to us making sure our foundation our faith in the Lord is solidified is not wanting to be entertained not wanting to be enticed because when we take that on when we are a people who we like being entertained and we can find ourselves being entertained by the wrong kinds of people, by the soothsayers, by the witches, by the false prophets, you know, because you have itching ears. And so you got to make your calling and your election. Sure. I like how Peter says your calling, not their calling, not our calling. He says your calling, because at the end of the day, You have to work out your own soul salvation with fear and with trembling. You have to live your life with urgency. Like, you got to live every day as if it's your last. Not that you live with fear, but you live with confidence, knowing that Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of your fate. He is the one writing out your story. But God can only write your story when you give him control. So that looks like you giving God the pen. You're not trying to write your own story, but you are submitted and you are yielded to God creating and finishing your story the right way. You want a nice finish. You want a nice ending. The word of God says that the end of a thing is better than the beginning. So you want the ending to be a good one. You know how you read stories and or you watch movies and you know the beginning may have started off good but then in the middle there was like a plot twist or you know just suspenseful acts and things that you didn't see coming. But Then you get to the end of the book or you get to the end of the story and it was just a nice ending. Like the family reunited, the couple reunited, the children got reunited back with their family. You know, they were split or separated or, you know, the child was abducted and kidnapped. And then at the end, it just warms your heart knowing that the story ended well. Well, this is what God wants for you and I, knowing that our story ended well because Each and every one of us is, our lives are being written out. Your life is being written out. You may not take value of your life because to you, this is all that there is. And so you waste your life. You waste your life like the 
prodigal son. You waste your life on money. You waste your life on fornication. You waste your life at the casino. You waste your life going to concerts and, you know, sports games. You waste your life mingling and mixing. You waste your life being vain. You waste your life being mundane and Solomon. And I know that I'm all over the place, but it's tying in together. Solomon says that it is all vanity. It's all vanity. It's all vain. It's all empty. It doesn't benefit you at the end of your life. It doesn't benefit you. And so as a believer, which hopefully you are, you have to make sure you got to know, you have to know that this is real. You got to know that this is real and that it matters what you do from day to day. It matters whether or not you seek God. It matters whether or not you read your Bible. It matters whether or not you are fitly joined with the rest of the body. Yeah. You can't just be an arm by yourself. You can't just be an eye by yourself. You have to be fitly joined with the rest of the body. Yeah. Every joint supplies something. You have to love your role. You have to love your calling. You have to have confidence in who you are. If you don't have confidence, then of course your foundation won't be a sure one. It won't be a strong one. When your foundation is strong and sure, then it's going to be a lasting one. That's why he can say here, it won't fail. Yeah, your foundation, it won't fall. Jesus promises that in the Gospels when he says, if any man hears my words, if any man hears my words, right? So you're not just a hearer of the word. You don't just go to church and hear the word and it stimulates your senses and it makes you feel good about what you just did yesterday or what you did before you walked in the doors. He says that if any man hears my word and does my word, meaning you have to apply And to apply means to take on, to take in. You are taking this in. You are taking this on because you believe it. It's not just literature. It's not just words on a page. But you take it on and you take it in. He says if any person does this, he will liken him on, liken him, sorry, unto a wise man. You are wise because you make wise decisions because you do wise things. He will liken him unto a wise man who built his house upon the rock. Who likes houses that are built with wood, straw, you know, the fake stuff, the fake, the fake wood. Who likes houses that are built upon the sand? You already know the foundation isn't strong because like the three little pigs, when the wind comes, when the wolf wants to come and blow up on your house, you know, when the enemy, when Satan wants to come and blow up on your house. He wants to cause some turbulence. He wants to mess with the ground. He wants to cause offense and adversity in your life. When he comes and those winds blows, the wind blows, your house is going to fall. Your faith is going to fall apart fall apart. Your foundation is going to fall apart. Your salvation is going to fall apart and you will walk away. You will, you will walk away. Why? Because it wasn't solidified. It wasn't, I can't necessarily say that it wasn't sincere because maybe there was parts of your walk that was just really genuine and sincere, but it wasn't real. Apparently it was surface level. It was shallow. It was shallow because as soon as a little wind came, you know, your emotions got the best of you. Your emotions got the best of you. Your feelings got the best of you. That's why he says you have to make your election, your choosing, sure. So, let's read. So, this is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Or you know what? (laughs) Let's just start at the beginning of the chapter because we need the word of God. We need the word of God. The word of God is a double edged sword and we need the word of God. We need to hear it. We need to read it and we need to apply it. So we need the word of God. So I am in second Peter verse one says Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ 
to them that have ordained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord, according to according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Through lust. We are partakers of God's nature when we receive Christ. When we receive the promises that he's made available to us. Knowing and understanding that we've escaped the world. We've escaped the world through the open door. Through the one door which is Jesus Christ. And he talks about how. In the world is lust. And we know John asks him that he says that what is in the world is the lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes. In the pride of life. So we've escaped the corruption. And besides this, giving all diligence. He says, add to your faith virtue. What is virtue? Virtue is goodness. Virtue is noble. Virtue is righteousness. The things that are of God. Godliness, goodness, meekness. Yeah, he says, add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. You need self-control. So all of these things work together. It's just like the fruit of the Spirit. It's just like what... Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 13, we need charity. We need temperance. We need the proper understanding of who we are as sons of God. If you don't know who you are, then how can you convince others of who you are? How can you convince others that, okay, we got some thumbs up. How can we convince others that our God is? Is the one true God. That his way is the only way. If you don't know who you are. How can you convince others of who they are? You have to know who you are. And so you need the proper understanding. You need the right knowledge of who you are as a son. You need confidence. Again that word confidence. It's important that you have confidence in knowing who you are. You got to know who you are. Because based on who you believe you are that determines the kinds of decisions that you make that determines how you live your life that determines whether or not you believe the word of God I don't know what you believe but you need to make a decision I don't know what you believe because there's a a lot of different things going on out there and the enemy is he is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour he's looking for people to take out especially those that have had encounters with the churches, those who have grown up in church, those who may have had a, a praying grandmother or a praying mom or someone in their family that may have been involved in, you know, the church, the church. But you, you got, you have to decide what's real for you. What is real? What is it all for? What is it all for? Because anybody can go to church and lift their hands and cry and scream and roll all on the floor and jump and dance but when I leave the house of God if what I've just received if there's no substance if there's not enough to keep me then what is it all for if I am not changing if I am not proving myself, if I am not examining myself, if I am not eating the word, if I am not applying it to the core, then what is it all for? Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Because those that can just all be emotions because we know people go to church faithfully every Sunday and they praise break, but they walk out of the doors the same. What is it all for? Because if your calling in your election isn't sure, then is it unsure? You got to consider. You have to know. You need all of these things 
So you need faith and virtue, but you also need virtue and knowledge. And you also need you also need knowledge and temperance. Temperance is self-control. You need self-control. How can you exemplify and display godly characteristics godly characteristics if you don't have self-control if you cannot bridle your tongue if you are a christian and every now and then you have to slip one in because you know it's in the bible i've heard believers profess believers say you know i say certain curse words because it's in the bible that is foolishness that is foolishness the word of god says can a fountain that produces water can it produce both bitter and sweet water? You wouldn't drink from that fountain. But the fountain is saying, but every now and then, you know, you got to add a little saltiness to the flow of the water. Every now and then, you got to add a little sweetness to the flow of the water. You wouldn't drink that fountain. And so a fountain, a healthy fountain, it cannot produce produce both. Yeah. Evil communication corrupts good manner. Good manners. <laughs> So you need temperance, but with the self-control, you need patience. You have to learn how to be patient. So it was mentioned last night in our women's Bible study of how we we already live in a microwave generation. And so we want things to just fall in our lap. And so when we engage God, we approach God with that same heart and that same mindset of God Wanting God to act now, wanting God to move now, wanting God to give an answer now, wanting God to answer prayer now. And because we don't know how to wait, because we already we are already being trained and conditioned and taught that you don't have to wait for things. Your world around you, you don't understand that you are being conditioned to think, to believe things you don't understand that. You don't believe that. You don't believe that you are being controlled and prepared for Antichrist. You don't believe that because you don't believe God, because you don't believe the word of God. And so many of you, you are being conditioned to think a certain way. Your world is trying to teach you how to think, how to act. Why do you think the AI technology, the artificial intelligence technology is be coming more and more visible you know you're seeing it in the workplaces you're seeing it all over social media you're seeing it in the stores why do you think that that is happening what is that all for what is that all for your world is trying to condition you how to think and so along with everything else your world is also conditioning you to be impatient what is this all for? Why are they pushing AI? Why is your world trying to condition you to get everything at such a fast pace? Your world is trying to make you impatient. And so when it comes to the things of God, when it comes to being patient, we don't know how to wait on God. We don't like to wait on God. And so most people, because they don't want to wait, then they never get the answer from God. They never get to see the hand of God move in their lives because they don't want to wait. And so, although you need self-control, you need patience. If you don't have patience, you're only going to go but so far. You're only going to go but so far. If you cannot wait on God to move, then you are going to be like someone who built their house up on the sand. When that wind comes, when the big bad wolf comes and blow on your house, you're going to be easily tossed up tossed to and fro. You're going to be easily uprooted. And it's not, it's not going to be anything for him to, to blow on your house and move on to the next one. Well, that was easy. Yeah. This person built their house out of straw. This person built their house out of wood. Yeah. Their faith was shallow. Their foundation was shallow. They were like the ground that or they were like the seeds that fell by the wayside, that fell on stony ground. Yeah, you did not fall on good ground. Your house was not built up on a solid rock. So you need all of this. And he says, into patience, godliness. You ought to be displaying godly like ways, godly like characteristics. What does that look like? That looks like daily obedience. That looks like striving for righteousness that looks like striving to live holy striving to live holy 
Yeah, not calling bad good and calling good bad. Calling things for what they are. Call it for what it is. Yeah, that means hating the things that God hates. If God hates it, then I hate I hate it because I am supposed to be becoming more like God. Yeah, that's what that word divine nature. God has a divine nature, a pure nature. God is light and in him there is no darkness. He has a divine nature, a pure nature, a holy nature. We are called to that. It's, and he says, and to godliness. So all of these things are working together. You cannot have one without the other. You need all of it. He's telling you how you have to be. Well, how am I to be as a Christian? And to godliness, brotherly kindness. You have to love the brethren. So you love God and you love his people. You need more compassion. You need more love for others in the body. You are not to shut up your bowels of compassion. I don't understand how people who profess and confess to be Christian hate people. They don't do people. How do you not do people? Because along with brotherly kindness, he says, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Not only do I have to not shut up my bowels of compassion to this person, but I have to love them too. If I love them, then I'm not going to shut up my bowels of compassion. And you know, it's so interesting that he puts charity last because out of all of this, they all, out of all of these things, if you lack charity, then nothing else matter matters. Charity fulfills the law. It is the greatest commandment. Charity fulfills the law. Love fulfills the law. Love God. You have to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And you have to love your neighbor as yourself. That's why you can't be a Christian and be selfish. How are you a Christian, (laughs) but you don't love people? How are you a Christian, but you don't love people? You have to have brotherly kindness. You have to be kind. So that means you may have to prefer that person before you. That means that you cannot have a heart of competition. You cannot be jealous. You cannot be envious. You have to love you. When you are confident in who God has called you to be, then there is no room for envy. There is no room for jealousy. There is no room for competition because you understand that as you have a role, And that your role is valuable, that this person also has a role and that their role is valuable. Whoever they are, whatever they are, if they are the train and you are the airplane, you love being in the sky. You love your job. You love your role. You love the fact that you are the one who gets to take passengers in the air from one place to another. And if you are a train, you you love being on the railroad tracks. You love being that train. You get to also take passengers from one place to another. And if you are a boat, you love your job. You're not you're not envious at the fact that you don't get to be on railroad tracks. You don't get to toot your own <laughs> train horn, but you love simply just being in the water and you also have a horn. Yeah, you also get to be in the water. You also get to take passengers from one place to another. And you love that when you love what you do, when you love who you are, then you can effectively do your job the right way. And so as a Christian, you need confidence to live out your calling, to fulfill your calling. How? Jesus, Holy Ghost. I think I just saw an angel. How can you live out your calling if you don't love what you are and who you are? You're not confident. You're too focused on what that person is doing. That's why you can hear it said, mind your business. Mind your, you have a business. You have a job. Mind your job. If you are too focused on, and I think Paul talks about something like that too. If you are, I think he calls it a busy body. And people, and you know, in people's business, you are a busy body. You're too busy minding this person's business that your job is left undone and unattended because you're too focused over here in these per- in these people's matters. You have your own job to attend to. You have your own responsibilities as a Christian. 
So Peter says, for if these things be done in you, it has to be done in you. So before it can flow outwardly, it has to flow inwardly because again, we are building, you are a builder, you are building outwardly and upwardly. And so before this thing can flow outwardly, it has to start inwardly. So he says, for if these things be in you, this has to be in you, virtue, faith, knowledge, temperance, patience, kindness, love, or charity. It has to be in you. That has to be in you. Yeah. Make room for God to expand your heart. You need expansion in your heart. You need expansion in your heart. And so he says, let these things be in you. So before it can be outwardly, it has to be in you. So that means you got to be a willing vessel. You have to be an open vessel. You cannot be closed off to people because of fear, because of pride, because of offense. If you want to make your calling an election, sure, then there's a work that has to be done in you first before you can even go on to the next stage. There has to be a great work done on the inside of you. And so he says, for if these things be in you and abound, so they got to remain. So that love, you have to hold on to that love. That patience, you have to hold on to that patience. You don't say, well, I loved yesterday and so I can just go back to not loving it has to remain in you. That love that remains is going to begin to expand. And then, you know, as it's growing and as it is expanding, God will give you more love. God will give you more patience. God will give you more temperance. He will give you more virtue. He will give you more godliness. He'll give you more because it has to remain. It has to stay because it's becoming who you are. It's becoming who you are. This is what we are. The sons of God, they're becoming. You are becoming more and more into the image, the perfect image of Christ, the perfect image of God. You are becoming. What does that mean? That means you are being built daily as you avail yourself, as you make yourself a willing vessel. You are being built as you are being built. You are being called to build as well. And so before you can build, you have to be built. You have to be built. How do I be built? By taking in the characteristics of Christ. And as I do, it has to remain. We don't just put it off and say, well, I was patient yesterday. I was caring yesterday. I was meek yesterday. I was, you know, I had temperance yesterday. I was patient yesterday. It has to remain. He says it has to abound. He says they make you, well, yeah. They make you that, let me slow down. They make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It has to remain so that you can be fruitful. You need, you see that? That's the fruit of the spirit. You need to be fruitful. You need to bear fruit. If they don't remain, then that means that it is uprooted. You don't want your seed to not have fallen on good ground because if it's not on good ground, if those things which have been sown in you and planted in you are not gone down deep, then you are going to be barren. You're not going to bear anything. You're not going to bear anything. You don't want to be unfruitful. But he says, he that lacks these things is blind. I don't need these things. I just need God in my heart. People think that being a Christian is all about them. I don't know who's teaching you this, who's lying to you, and what you are reading. But the Bible says that I have to love my neighbor as myself. The Bible says that charity suffers long. Paul says if I lack charity, it doesn't matter that I can prophesy. It doesn't matter that I can interpret tongues, dreams, word of knowledge, all of the above. It doesn't matter. He says, if I lack charity, if I lack the love of people and the love for God, then you are as broken and out of tune instruments. Or he says, you are like broken and out of tune instruments. When you move, because <laughs> you know, you make, a, you make a sound, your life makes a sound. When your life is making a sound, it sounds horrible. You ever heard music that just... The instruments are not tuned. Have you ever heard an out of tune guitar? <laughs> have you ever heard an out of tune guitar? It doesn't sound good. Have you ever heard someone try to play the keys and they, they have no clue what they're doing? Like, get off the keyboard, please. 
Yeah, it doesn't sound good. Have you ever heard someone play the drums? And all they do is hit the cymbals. And it sounds like broken glass. You're going to want them to get off. Hey, please get off. It sounds like you're over there breaking glass. Get off. Your life, if you lack charity, if you lack these things, your life sounds like broken instruments. And he says, and you are blind. How do you like that? You are blind. You cannot see. And Jesus tells us that if we are blind and we cannot see, then he says, you don't know where you're going. You might as well walk in the dark because, you know, to be blind is to be in the dark. You can't see. You can't see. And he says, you're not going to know where you where you're going. And if you fall and you're falling and you fall in the ditch, you didn't see it because you're walking in the dark. So blindness can also look like you walking in the dark. He says, and cannot see afar. You don't have foresight. You don't have discernment. You can't see afar. You only see right now. You can't see beyond the moment. That's what he's saying. You can't see beyond the moment. You're you're blinded by pride. You're blind. You're blinded by selfishness. You're blinded by laziness. You're blinded by entitlement and victims mentality. You're blinded. You can't see afar. You can't see the work that God is going to do from afar off. And so you don't live beyond the moment. You you live in the moment because to you, this is all that there is. And he says you're blind. And so you don't feel as though you need to put forth that amount of effort to love, that to be patient, you know, to have brotherly kindness. You can't see beyond the moment. You can't see afar off. Yeah. All you see is what's right here. And so you don't see what it takes to love that person. You don't see the benefit. You don't see the reward. You don't see the joy on the father's face knowing that you got over you because all you see is what's right now. And so he says you cannot see it for all and has forgotten that you were purged from old sin. He says not only can you not see you don't have foresight. But he says, you've forgotten what it was like when you were in sin and when it took for somebody to love you, when it took for someone to be patient with you. Yeah, you forgot what it was like. He says, wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fail. That's a promise. You sure never, if I take in all of this, if I take this on, if I allow the work to be done in me and through me, then he says, I will make my calling and election sure. And he says that these things won't fail. It won't fail. Yeah, your foundation will be solidified. It will be set. It will be set. Give the diligence. You got to be devoted and dedicated to this walk because it's your calling. It's not. So your calling isn't my calling and my calling isn't your calling. Your calling is your calling and you have to examine yourself. You have to prove yourself. Prove your worth. What is it all for? I'm not saying prove it to man, but prove it to yourself. Because if, if you're not convinced, how can you convince anyone else that you've been called to this? That we are actually building. How can you convince others that you've been called and ordained? That you've been appointed for this work? How can you convince people? If you lack confidence, then you are not going to convince anyone else that they've been called to a work too. How can you convince me? How can you persuade me? How can you make your calling and election sure if you lack the confidence necessary? You need the confidence as a believer. You need the diligence. You need the diligence. You need the consistency. You need to be persistent. You need to keep momentum. You have to keep pace. That's why he says that all of these things have to abound in in you, meaning you don't stop. It doesn't stop. You don't just stop loving. You have to continue loving. You know how marriage works. You have to stay in love with the person. You don't just start off in love and fall out of love. You have to stay in love. My faith in God has to remain. My love for God has to remain. I don't just start off in God because, you know, it's said that. A man's days in the Lord are 
at his beginning. I forget how they how they say it. You know, that honeymoon stage when you first get saved and you want to tell everybody about God, but they can't hear it because, you know, God is not calling them like he like he's called you. You want to tell everybody you have this this zeal or I'm sorry, this this zeal. I always say zeal. You have this zeal. You have this fire of passion burning on the inside of you. And so you want to tell everyone. But then over time. You know, as you remain in the faith, it seems as though that fire kind of dims down a little bit. It kind of goes out a little bit. Your passion, your love, your fiery love that you have for God, you were so in love. It kind of diminishes. But you got to keep that fire burning. You have to keep that fire rekindled. I think that's how you say it. You have to keep it ignited. In other words, you got to keep it ignited. So you don't just fall in love, but you stay in love with God every day. Every day you have to stay in love. Every day you have to stay ignited. Every day you have to stay burning. Yeah, the fire on the altar will ever be burning. It has to remain. The offering has to remain burning. The fire can never go out. And it shall never go out. It has to remain burning. So my fire, my my zeal for the Lord, my passion for the Lord, it cannot go out. Because this is long-term commitment. This is permanent. My my relationship with the Father, it's permanent. It's permanent. This is not no marriage that, you know, we started off in love. And then some way, somewhere along the line, we just fell out of love. And so, you know, that's how divorce happened. People just fall out of love. They stop. Fighting to maintain the fire. They stop making a decision to love. Because you know to love is a decision. It can't be based on a a feeling. Because sometimes you may not want to love. Sometimes you may not want to be patient. Sometimes you may not want to have self-control. But it's a decision. That's why we can't do things based on how we feel. That's why we cannot live by what we feel and and what we see. It got to be based on truth. Well, what is truth? What 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 is right? What is divine? What is godly? What is virtue? It has to be based on those things. Yeah. Because I may not feel like doing this over there. I may not feel like being a Christian, but it can't be based on it. It has to be based on what's true. Whatsoever things are true. Whatsoever things are pure. Whatsoever things are honest. Whatsoever things are of a good report. It can't be based on how I feel. Because today, I may not feel like persevering. Today, today I may not feel like getting up off of the ground. Today, I may feel like being lazy. Today, I may feel entitled. Today, I may feel like withholding and drawing back. But I can't do things based on how I feel because it's not about me. It is my calling though. It is my calling. It is your calling. And you can't afford to live by what you see and how you feel. It can't be based off of a feeling. It has to be based on what's true. Is the word of God true? Let God be true in every man alive. What is true right now in this moment? That's why Paul can say that in Philippians. Whatsoever in Philippians 4. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Don't think about your situation. Don't think about what you don't have, what you should have. Don't think about that offense. Don't think about how that person is flourishing and and. Moving in ministry, don't think about that because those things are going to get you out of the way. They're going to move you out of the way. Your foundation, the foundation of your faith has to be Christ. He is the rock. He is the chief cornerstone. So if we are building a house, that means it needs to be founded upon a sure and a strong foundation. It needs to be a sure house. It needs to be a strong house. So I cannot be the kind of person who is living by what I see and how I feel. The world lives like that. The world lives by what they see and how they feel. If they feel like they don't want to love today, then they're not going to. If they feel like they don't want to move in this direction today, then they're they're not going to. You as a son of God, you are called to higher depths and higher heights. You are called to build outwardly and upwardly. You are called to a great work. You are building the kingdom. You are building the kingdom of God here in the earth. That takes confidence. That takes 
you making your calling. This is your calling. It's your calling. You got to be confident in who God has called you to be. Who are you? What are you? Do you know? Do you know? When I know who I am and whose I am and what I am, then I'm going to make decisions based on who I believe I am. If I believe that I am a son, if I believe that I have things that I have to maintain, if I believe that I have to keep pace and momentum, that I'm not going to make any kinds of decisions that will slow me down or take me out of the way. I'm going to be the kind of person that's going to count the cost. Oh no, I can't give too much to that because that may take me out of the way and I can't afford to lose, lose it. I can't afford to risk it. I can't afford to risk it. It's too costly. It's too risky. I'm making decisions that's going to move me in a direction that will make my calling in my election. Sure, I'm a builder. And so I can't afford to give too much attention to what that, what that person is saying or what these are saying or what they're speaking online or what they're doing. I'm building right now. I'm Nehemiah. I am Nehemiah. I'm building. I'm doing a great work. The sons of God are doing a great work. We are making our calling in our election. Sure. We are building a sure foundation. We are kingdom builders. Yeah. We are businessmen and business women. So we cannot afford to come down and get on the enemy's level at that level in that sense. Yeah. He got to get on our level. He has to catch up. Oh, no. We are building. We can't come down. We don't come down. Eagles, they don't come down until it's time to eat. They don't come down unless it's for a purpose. No, I can't afford to come down for nothing. If I come down, it's for purpose. But the sons of God, you see, we don't don't come down. We stay up and we continue upward. Yeah. You got to make your calling in your election. Sure. Nehemiah says, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Don't you see I'm busy? When you are busy doing what you are supposed to do, then you can't afford to come down because you're so busy. I'm sorry. Did you say something? I'm too busy building. I'm too busy building. That's what he had to tell Sembalot and Tobiah. I'm busy. I don't have time to come down. Okay. Okay. That's nice. I'm building right now. I'm a kingdom builder. I'm a businessman. I got work to do. I can't afford to stoop down to your level. I can't afford to worry about what they're saying on social media and their opinions and what they're doing. I'm building. I have a work to do. I can't afford to lose anything because I need it from where I'm going. I'm going somewhere. The sons of God, they're on a freight train and they're moving at a rate that if you get in the way, you might get knocked over. So either get on board or get out of the way. We're building. We're going somewhere. We have somewhere that we're going and we got to get there at all costs. No, I'm sorry. I don't, I just don't have time to give attention to what the enemy is doing, what the enemy is talking about over there. The fact that he's throwing rocks and kicking dust. I don't have time for it. I'm going somewhere. I'm going somewhere. I got to make my calling and my election. Sure. I have to examine myself. I have to know that my faith is solidified. It's set. I got to know it. Oh yeah. I got to make it to the end. Those that endure until the end will be saved. I want to be among the saved, but you are saved. I got saved. I am saved and I will be saved. Yeah, in the end. He says saved. They will be saved. Yeah. Mm, Jesus. Yeah, so God bless you. God, God is doing great things and you can choose to be a part of the great things that he is doing. He's made us exceeding and precious promises that we want to see fulfilled in our lives. No, I want to see that God promised it to me. He promised it. And if he, if he promised it, then that means he's going to do it. He's going to fulfill it. And I want to remain in position to see it unfold. There are so many different things that God is getting ready to do. But if you're not in position, then you won't see it unfold. You won't get to be a partaker, as Peter was saying. You won't be able to be a partaker in what God is already done and is doing and will begin to do. Yeah. May God give you the ears to hear in Jesus' name.